so I compost a lot, a lot more than most people, uh, but that is the foundation of a garden. If you have five inches of space, you can, you can grow food. city lots. Uh, I have a 5,400 square foot lot here in the city that I've been developing over the past two years. We started out with six plant species on the property and we are now nearing 100 uh, perennial plant species. Uh, edible vegetables, fruits, uh, native wildflowers, um, and just a lot of bounty. So let's go take a look. These are all kale and collard greens. Um, these are technically annuals, but they will last um, usually around a year, sometimes longer, depending on how they handle the pests and whatnot. Uh, but I've been harvesting off of this now for about six months and it will continue well into the summer months as well. Um, I've got cucumelons hanging in there. I always succession plant my radishes. I have a variety of radishes growing right now. Um, daikons, breakfast radish, as well as rat tail radish. Um, we've got cabbages, lots of leafy greens. I've been able to harvest all of the leafy greens that my family consumes on site. We have not purchased leafy greens in over two years now. Leafy greens are a really great uh, crop because you can fit so much of it in such a small space. Um, so if you are looking to meet your self-sufficiency needs or if you're, if you're looking for a place to start, leafy greens can be a really good, a good one for that. Um, just because you can grow so much in a small space and they lose nutrition so fast. Uh, so it gives you a lot of bang for your buck. I also have nightshades growing, eggplants, tomatoes. Um, we have broccoli. Um, it's a Hansai Thai. It's from Working Food. It is a leafy green flowering broccoli. You can eat all parts of it. Edible, super heat tolerant, great for spring planting. Um, we've also got, let's see here, um, nasturtiums and I use those for leafy greens but also for the edible flowers. We've got herbs like basil and fennel. I also grow epizote. We grow um, our own black beans um, and epizote can help with the digestion process. Um, makes it a little bit easier to digest those beans so we grow that as well. Um, and that's a lot of the annual vegetables I have going right now. I do have some squash that volunteered themselves. I tend to grow seminole tatumi, um, and Tahitian melon. They're all great varieties of squash uh, to plant in our spring season. They'll produce over the summer months. Um, and they're a lot more resistant or resilient to powdery mildew and the squash vine borer. Good varieties for here in Florida. When I first started developing the site, I knew that I wanted to make my own compost. So we purchased the home in summer. We were doing a full renovation, weren't even living here, and I started my compost piles. I started nine yards worth of compost and turned it every two weeks. In two and a half months, I had three and a half yards of finished compost, which I was able to put in for my initial annual vegetable garden beds. The day we moved into the house, we were able to harvest our first produce. All of these beds are filled with my compost, along with a few um, soil amendments. Uh, worm castings are my favorites, um, azomite, and a few other items, coconut coir. I do have videos on that if you want to check out the channel um, that go in more in depth on those, um, those processes. But all of these beds are dedicated to annual vegetables. Um, it gives you really fast, quick production, and you can get growing pretty easily. There are lots of crops that you can grow year round here. This is our spring, that, uh, spring coming into spring season. Um, so we have to be very mindful of heat tolerant vegetables at this time of year. It sounds great to be planting lots of broccoli and cauliflower right now, but within a month's time, we are all going to be sweltering. I know it's hard to admit, but that's how it works here. Uh, so we have to have that in our, in our heads as we're planting our spring garden. I always choose heat tolerant vegetables because not only is it hot during that time of year, it is also very, very dry. 
our drought here in Florida doesn't usually end until March, April, depending on where you are in the state. So picking the right varieties goes a really, really long way. After the annual vegetable garden was installed, my very next step was to plant some perennial vegetables here on my property. Annual vegetable gardens, it's what I teach, it's what I do. I show people the basics of vegetable gardening here in Florida. But I also think it's critically important for resiliency and just a little bit of self-sufficiency to also incorporate perennial vegetables into the landscape. Those are the ones that you can count on no matter what. They typically, not always, but typically, are not gonna need any care from you, aside from maybe a little bit of pruning once a year. Um, they don't really need fertilizer. They don't need improved soil. They don't need water. These things are, are plants you can count on no matter what. I do have a video um, that I call my survival garden trifecta, uh, and that is moringa, chaya, and cassava. These plants are nutritious. They have a lot of calories and they are incredibly easy to grow here in Florida um, from seed or from cuttings. So um, those are definitely, in my opinion, something that anybody who is interested in growing their own food should incorporate into their gardens here in Florida. So this is a jujube and it is a fruit tree. I have on this property, I really wanted to show the potential that you can do in a very short period of time. Uh, so this was planted two years ago. It has already grown from a sapling to this size and it is loaded with fruit in just two years. Um, this will produce up to several hundred pounds of fruit once um, fully grown, which is a little bit bigger than it is now. Um, so probably next year I'll be, I'll be close to that, that mark. Um, I anticipate probably 20 to 50 pounds off the tree this year. So I really focus on fast producing and resilient food here on the property. I also incorporated things um, for fast uh, production like bananas, mulberries, um, Jamaican cherry, Barbados cherry. All of these fruit trees will produce for you within one to two years, as long as they are in the right place with the right needs. If you're meeting their needs, they will produce for you. So I also like to um, walk the talk. So when I teach uh, my clients and my um, students about gardening, I grow and raise beds. I have the space and the time and that's um, what I choose. But I also teach people who work in really small spaces, apartments, um, somebody who's moving and doesn't, you know, they rent and they don't want to put the beds in or whatever the case is. So um, if I'm going to teach you, I want to be able to show you. Uh, so I work with um, green stock and I grow, um, I, I, I use this a lot for leafy greens, right? Because you succession plant it, so it's quick turnover crops that I'm able to harvest. So I have lots of Asian greens that I'll harvest, bok choy, tatsoi, chi jim and sai, that kind of thing. Um, also lettuces, I have a little bit of kohlrabi that's starting to come in. Um, I have peas, I have strawberries, I've grown, um, I've, I've grown the tomatoes and the cucumbers out of them. They have a lot of potential and it's a soil-based system. So it's something that you can always kind of control and um, to fill if you need. When you're growing in other systems, when you have constant inputs, I think it can potentially limit you long-term um, or from a self-sufficiency perspective. So I really like these systems because they are soil-based and pretty much no maintenance. Uh, so I compost a lot, a lot more than most people. Uh, but that is the foundation of a garden, and I think it is critically important to do. So I collect food scraps from around town. I go to coffee shops, produce stands, breweries, and collect their waste products, and I compost it here on site. Uh, typically several hundred pounds of waste every week. Uh, and I turn the piles, and within a few months, I get finished compost. This pile is pretty much ready. Um, might need a little bit longer. Uh, I'll use it for replenishing my beds as I plant for spring. But I do a three pile system so that as I fill up one pile, I'm turning it, I move to the next pile, continue adding, and then continue on to a new pile. By the time I get back to the first pile, that compost is finished, I'm able to put that in my garden and then use that space to continue the composting process. Um, I try, even though I'm on a larger scale, to do things as efficiently as possible. So we don't turn more than necessary. At most, we only turn our piles every two weeks, but oftentimes it might be a month, a month and a half, two months before I turn the pile. Uh, 
I think it's really important to make gardening fun, motivating. If it's a chore or if it is a huge time commitment and you're already overtaxed, then you're not going to do it. Systems are going to start falling apart and it's going to be a frustration rather than a joy. And if that means you only grow a single pot of herbs, then that's what you should be doing because gardening is more than just growing food. It's also about connecting to nature, slowing down, and taking time for yourself. So um, being realistic with your time and your money and your space is, is really, really important when you're figuring out what to do uh, on your property. So the hens will lay without a rooster. Okay. He was a male that I got as a chick mm -hmm. and was docile enough and I just decided to keep him. Yeah. And um, he's actually really friendly. Um, some of them get aggressive, especially the older they get. Um, he'll, he'll let, he only lets me do it, um, but he'll let me pet him and everything. He yeah. um, <laughs> doesn't love it, but he'll yeah. tolerate it. And because I have a rooster, I am able to allow, I have a broody hen that goes broody two, three times a mm -hmm. year. So she raises clutches of eggs for oh, me. And I'm able to distribute the chicks to somebody who's looking for chickens. Um, so yeah, it's um, in my opinion, should be legal um, because that is being able to yeah. raise your own food, right? Yeah. Like yes, that is exactly. that is you We're being able to take care of yourself. Yeah. Like why that should be illegal is beyond me. But um, so yeah, um, I've got my hens. I we collect eggs, uh, and they're also really good compost makers. So we yeah. use the manure as fertility on site, and they also are good at. Um, going through the mulch and everything like that and dealing with some of the common pests that we would have, grubs, that kind of thing. So they're workers on the farm as well as producers. So this is Ethiopian kale. It is a really, really hardy green. Um, this reseeded itself um, from last year's crop and you can see it going to seed again. Um, this doesn't get any water from me. It doesn't have any sort of special soil. It can tolerate our cooler winters and our warmer summers. This is a really, really good plant, I think, to have incorporated into your landscape. It doesn't need special care from you, um, but it also reseeds really easily. So um, something that, in my opinion, is really important if you're able to, is to save your own seed. When you can save your own seed, you are not only guaranteeing that you have that seed if you need it, but you're also selecting, without knowing it, um, for the best crops for your area. So this is heirloom gardening um, in action. Saving your own seed is critically important and the only way we're gonna maintain diversity in our crops, um, especially with um, temperatures changing, um, getting more extreme, um, climate change, um, however you see that. When we're able to save seed on a local scale, we are creating res resilience within our seeds so that um, they're better able to adapt to those changes over time. Microgreens are the fastest crop you can grow. Uh, I used to do small scale commercial microgreen sales, but um, they're, depending on the crop, about 100 times more nutrient dense than the parent plant. So if you grow broccoli and you're harvesting the, the baby broccoli, it's about 100 times more nutrient dense, which is incredible. This is like nature's vitamins. And so I always grow small amounts of it. Um, the other thing that I really like about it is it's ready to harvest in seven to 10 days, sometimes 14 days, depending on what you're growing in the season. Um, so it's incredibly fast production. So if you want to get growing super fast, that's a great option. It's also great for small spaces. So I use little, you can do bigger, um, but I use little, little, um, what are these? Four by four, five by five, something like that, little trays. So, and they stacked. If um, I, I have a class on my channel that goes through like how to grow microgreens, but um, you can literally stack them up. So if you have five inches of space, you can, you can grow food. So this is something for small scale gardeners. Um, if you literally have an apartment that doesn't even have a, um, you know, a porch or a patio, grow microgreens on your windowsill. It's, it's, it's something anybody can achieve. I try to emphasize creating systems using permaculture principles for the least amount of maintenance on your part. So these bananas really like sun, moisture, 
and nutrients. These are three things that are really, really, really important to bananas. That's why a lot of people will plant a banana and never see it do anything. They find a spot in the middle of their yard, they put a single banana there, and they walk away and leave it. It never gets water, it doesn't get any nutrients, might have enough sun, but it doesn't have the other two um, helping it out. So this system here is kind of a little bit of a closed loop system. I planted things densely to kind of create a mini forest effect, right? So it traps and captures humidity and keeps it in the soil. I also did a, sl a small berm around the edge of the planting to keep the water in the system as long as possible. And I mulched it and composted it so it has really rich soil to hold the water as long as possible. Then I planted pigeon peas, which are a legume. It's a nitrogen fixing plant. So instead of it using nutrients like most plants, it's actually taking it. Um, it has a little beneficial relationship with bacteria in the soil and it is able to make its own fertilizer. It makes nitrogen by pulling it from the air with this bacteria. So these are actually putting nutrients back into the soil. This plant is essentially feeding my bananas. And so that takes one less thing off my plate, right? When the system is able to kind of circle around and maintain itself, it's one less thing for me to worry about and it's that much more production for me. Um, so I also have planted in here other um, produce that likes the same typical um, growing conditions. So I also have papaya planted in here. I have lemongrass. I also put in a variety of different native wildflowers uh, for pollinators. That is one of my biggest suggestions if you were looking to grow sustainably and organically is to create a ecosystem or a habitat where all of the beneficial insects are well supported. So having things blooming year round, having habitat for them to make their homes in, it is going to, again, take the, the work off of you and allow the good bugs in the garden to manage the bad bugs for you so that you don't have to. Um, in this garden, I very, very, very rarely treat anything. I try to let nature balance itself out. Um, if I do feel it's necessary, if I have some seedlings that are, you know, if they get pests and they only have two, three leaves, I'll hand pick. Um, but for the most part, I kind of just let nature take its course. Sometimes I lose some crops, definitely happens. Um, but I'm also not out there constantly having to spend my time and my money and my worry and frustration having to literally battle it out on a regular basis because there are always going to be bad bugs here especially in Florida so if I have the good guys working with me then when I do go out in the garden it's not going to be this constant catch-up um, where I'm trying to get the bugs off of here treat this oh it's been two weeks need to go back and retreat here that kind of thing it just sends you down a spiral where things are so far out of balance that they aren't going to self-regulate so as difficult as it is, um, you know, planting and creating a habitat for those, those beneficial insects and stepping back and letting it play, play itself out is really, for the long term, going to be the easiest management system for you. Uh, so the purpose and the intent behind me developing this space is not only to feed myself, but it is to teach others. That is my goal, my mission in life is to get as many people growing their own food and having control over their food as possible. So I use my homestead, my space, as a teaching space as well. Uh, I have local plant pickups and seed pickups from my house weekly so people in my community can come by the house. We have all small local growers, uh, non-certified organic, um, that will bring their their um, their annual veggies, their perennial vegetables, fruit trees to my site. People can come here, pick up plants every weekend. Um, I've got a class that I'm teaching um, later in February, Urban Homesteading 101. We're doing a two day intensive where people are gonna come, they're gonna get their hands dirty. We're gonna you know, learn about composting. We're gonna learn about permaculture principles. We're gonna learn about annual and perennial vegetable gardening and just kind of dive into all these topics. We're gonna go over worm castings and, and just building building a, a closed loop circle, even in an urban setting. Uh, so we really try to reach out and work with folks in as many ways as possible, uh, just to show people that even when you're in a small space, even when you think you're limited by an HOA or by the city or by your neighbors, you can still grow food, you can still have bounty on your site, uh, and it's a lot easier to achieve than you might think. I basically, if there's a need that I consistently hear from my, my, my students and my clients, we try to fill that need as best as possible. We have no organic vegetable starts. Mm -hmm. 
um, in our area. We don't. Wow. Yeah. Um, these are non-certified organic. Mm -hmm. They're all small local growers, but they're all grown from organic seed with organic soil. Mm -hmm. You know, using organic principles. Yeah. Um, so this gives people an annual vegetable outlet that is um, fitting. We also all are growers ourselves, and so all of the varieties are actually heirloom varieties that are well suited to our climate, right? Because like that's a huge issue. You go to Home Depot and they sell. They stock the same plants for a quarter yeah, yeah. of the U.S. Yes, right. So exactly. what grows well here is not going to be growing well in the, the mountains of North Carolina mm -hmm. or vice versa, right? Yeah. So all of the um, vegetables that we sell, um, all of the live plants are always in season. If we don't sell something in time, we pull it so that if you're a beginner gardener, you're not going to walk into planting tomatoes in summer, yes. which I think is just like a tragedy because people are interested and yeah. they try yes. and then they fail yeah. and they give up. So like hopefully this is a way to like set them up for as much success as possible. We have the varieties that grow well here. We have them in season um, and we gave them a good head start. Um, so hopefully uh, they have as much success as possible in the garden. That's, that's kind of our goal here. Um, I also did, a lot of people were getting really overwhelmed with um, the seeds and the seed catalogs and knowing what to plant yeah. here. Um, so uh, I'm just a wholesaler. There are some seed that I save here that are hard to find varieties like the Ethiopian kale and like um, Puerto Rican black bean, different varieties that aren't gonna be in the big box or like the larger scale catalogs. We do save on site or from local growers, but um, I have a seed site where people across the state of Florida can go and it's all stuff that actually grows well here. And then I, on it, I put it in North, Central, South. Like this is a good time to plant it for your region. So like, it's not necessarily my seed, but I'm trying to help eliminate as much guesswork as possible mm -hmm. to set them up for the most success and where do possible. people find that so you can go to my website theurbanharvest.com and you can find um, my seed shop if you're local you can check out the local plants i have all my events there i have um, recommended resources like um, different soil companies um, to get good quality soil from. I have uh, a library of books that I've read over the years that I found really helpful to growing here in Florida. I also have a seed club so if you're um, wanting a little bit of guidance in the beginning and you're trying to get a flow of growing year-round or of just what to uh, what to grow in general different varieties I send out three varieties of seeds each month it's mailed to your door one leafy green one vegetable and one either herb or flower each month. And it comes with a card, gives you planting information. It tells you um, maintenance tips, um, harvesting tips, um, even cooking ideas um, so that you can get a grasp of some of the different options you have available. Um, I think it's an, an, kind of important, especially heading into the spring season, if you're from up north and you just moved down, like that's prime planting season. Our prime planting season's fall. So we're kind of flip-flop from the rest of the country. So if you start trying to plant tomatoes in, you know, March, April, it, you're not gonna do well. Um, so this can give you alternatives, kind of outside of the box options. Like a lot of people think that you can't grow leafy greens year round here. You can, you absolutely can grow leafy greens year round. Lettuces, no, but leafy greens certainly. So. Um, if you're, if you want to start growing leafy greens for yourself and your family around, you can, you know, amaranth or, um, Egyptian spinach or Ethiopian kale or some perennials like chaya, like all of these different options can create a system where you can provide for yourself year round, um, with just a little bit of know-how or knowledge to get you through that, that initial 